I was freelancing around. I was doing live action, I, you know, and, and theater. I was in London. I did a bit in LA. I, I sort of, I moved around. I didn't quite know what I wanted to do. And then I was teaching. I was doing little workshops of teaching people, you know, how to sculpt or make a puppet, make a rod puppet and stuff like that, things that I'm interested in. And it was a chance sort of um, meeting with George or Georgina Haynes. And it was, it was that moment and, and we met and, and she, you know, she invited me to the studio and, and I saw it and it was, it was wonderful. Cause it was, you know, I, I, by that point I knew of Coraline obviously. And I, I knew that Leica was up there. I just, that was it. So going into this, this amazing space and seeing all the things that, you know, that was the connection. And then uh, I interviewed, I, I submitted my portfolio you know I it was just by chance and, and all that and then we clicked you know it I came in certainly for puppets I certainly you know um, it was always that way and it was to do whatever you know I'm a fabricator as well so they knew I could do all these different things and it was useful because they didn't quite know where to place me at the time and I think in some ways they still don't at times because I like to move around I like to create the whole thing you know and they were seeing my puppets and seeing how I just do the arc and I get on with it and so I've I've done everything I, I've mold made and I've, I've costumed I've built puppets I've, I've done a little armature work and I've done it just I, I love it all and and now I'm a sculptor now I sculpt for them um, I did on box trolls and and now Kubo and the two strings which is gonna come out and that sort of thing it's it's great I was brightly nervous to go. I mean, I have no idea about animation, and yet they I had no need to worry because that was the nice thing I found. It's like, well, they taught me what I didn't, you know, what I needed to know and the ways they do things, and, and, and I got to learn very quickly of how things are made in their certain way, and that was brilliant. I mean, it's a... When you find that sort of company, when you find that fit, it's it's brilliant. It's It's that moment of like, yeah, okay, I belong, and let's see what we can do. Because I grew up in puppetry, you know, my, my parents, my Brian Fr Froud and Wendy Froud, and they, uh, they, you know, designed the Dark Crystal and Labyrinth, and, and we grew up with the Hensons and, and being a part of that world. And, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to be the baby in the Labyrinth, and that sort of stood me really well because I got the chance to meet amazing people in my life growing up. I got to be around stunning artists and just know them, you know, or talk to them. and. And that really helped me uh, be creative or or grow in myself. And but my passion was always live action puppetry. It was always um, films and, and creature effects and, and 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 seeing all these amazing fantasy creatures come to life. I wanted to do that. I wanted to be, you know, I wanted to be Jim Henson, you know, like everyone else. That was the thing. And and to see the influence that had on the world was was just amazing. So that's where I was heading and that's what I was feeling and then stop motion was this beautiful anim like animation of puppetry which I didn't necessarily understand but I admired greatly. And it stems back to um, Yang Schwankmeyer's Alice. I mean that was for me that stop motion movie was like was was what I grew up with. I was watching that 9 years old and trying to show my friends who have I mean it would creep them out, you know, it's got skulls and and things and it's all moving and it's it's just weird and I was loving that. I thought that's my world. That's where I want to be. Um but I didn't know what it was. I just knew I loved it. So that was the journey. It was sort of I did everything I could to to sort of feel like, you know, this is, this is me, or no, wait, this is me, or maybe this is me. It was that feeling of, of you know, finding myself, you know, growing up and, and being part of the family that, you know, really created that fantasy world, the Fraudian trolls and goblins and, and, and things like that that people just absolutely loved. And it, meeting people as I grew up and as we would meet people in the world, they would say what an influence Dark Crystal made on them or Labyrinth and that's what got them into the industry or that's what started them on their journey. It was always amazing to hear that. It was always um, so wonderful and, and strange and to hear that that, that was their influence and, and I agree. I was like, well, I'm just as much a fan as I am part of it because um, I love my father's work in that sense. So the natural transition of all that was me becoming who I am and pushing those boundaries forward with them and now you know creating my own stuff because that's what I did you know Lyco is amazing and we do the 
projects they do, and then I still had to do my own art. I still wanted to create. I wanted to get those fantasy characters out. And so I did. I kept sculpting, I kept creating and fabricating dolls and little puppets and things. And then it culminated in an art show in New York that my parents and I were just, you know, we were doing a show. And that's when I connected with Heather Henson again for the first time in, in many years. And she asked if, you know, would I do a short film? Let's, let's try something. And, and I said, well, absolutely, yes. And then I realized I said yes, and then I had to do something. But that was, that was the catalyst. It was the moment. And, and it was nothing more than just asking and saying yes. So I went off and I, I wrote the story of, of you know, my, my short film, Lessons Learned. I wrote the story. I had my mother come in and we wrote together. She's an amazing writer now that she, and, and my parents and I and my father and I would sit down and we talked about the characters. And it was just, it was well, a dream come true for me in a funny way because we were working together. It was all family and we were being so creative. And I was gonna show the world puppets that they hadn't seen for a very long time. I loved theater because and it, it's the medium, I mean, certainly growing up in England, theater is, is really big there, and the idea that you, you start there is, is, is really important. You can't hide anything in theater, or you have to work very hard to hide something. And, and that was the best part about it, is that you, when creating, you know, I was creating masks and small puppets and, and different things like that, and it's not like a film. You know, you have to, you're building for a certain reason to show the, very, the person in the very back. And to, and to be able to, to create pieces in that way, I learned a lot. I learned a lot about you know, simplifying and, and making things work time and again and, and not being fussy about something. When people can get really bogged down with the idea of that detail and the, oh, it has to be like this, it has to look like this and it looks beautiful up here, but what about out there? You know, a puppet um, especially is something that doesn't really work. It doesn't necessarily do much. And yet the conceit is, and the audience's conceit is, it does everything, and it is a living thing. So that was the magic that I tried to figure out. You know, it's like, why does it work like that? And, and that, uh, what can I use, and what, how can I give, give, do my thing in that area? And that's why theater was my first sort of love of, of figuring that out, because you, you, can't, you can't hide. Well, Ray Harryhausen. Ray Harryhausen. Yeah, I mean... You look at it now, it's still really good. I mean, that, that man was a, is a genius, or he was a genius, and that's what pioneered everything. And so I grew up on those, and that was, it was kind of like Sunday afternoon watching on TV in England. You know, they would come on and, and, and be on TV, and we'd watch and sit and watch those in the afternoon, and then, you know, Indiana Jones and all those sorts of films would come along as well. And you'd see the, you'd see it, there was a, a beautiful balance of puppets. In, in, all, in all things that we were watching at that time. Um, and the 90s were great for those sorts of things in film. Um, and so I, you know, it was amazing to see that and then it disappeared. I think it, it really disappeared after Ray wasn't obviously creating things like that and stop motion was put to the side or put in little boxes and it was maybe for kids, it was maybe for something else and, and until Nightmare Before Christmas came out and that was probably the biggest moment for stop motion. CG, I mean, it, everyone thought it was the, the answer. You know, the moment you saw a CG, and even Labyrinth had the, the owl in the beginning was the, like a CG owl. That was, it was the biggest thing, you know, for, for them. And that was, it was a beginning of an end to the idea that puppets could do things for camera or do things for film and, and, and forward those ideas and, and have an actual character on set when you didn't need to, you could do it in CG, and you had the freedom to create these things afterwards, and you could show whatever you wanted. That's proving out to be wrong, I think. You know, it, yes, um, it, there was a time that everyone thought this is the answer, but now people don't want it. People are going, yeah, but that's CG. That's not, that's not real. So now we're coming back to the idea of what's real. And if you know it's a character that actually is on that set or actually in that environment, no matter what it is, you know, it's, it's like seeing Alien for the first time. It's a man in a suit, but you believe every moment of that thing coming at you. And that's the most terrifying thing because it, it exists. You know it's out there. Um, 
and that's what a puppet does. That's what um, you know stop motion does, and that's what uh, characters like that. And it was CG. So you could you didn't necessarily believe that all the time, and now. It's a balance. It's a fine balance. You know, you are seeing the most amazing CG characters come out, and you're seeing the most amazing advance in puppetry coming out. I mean, Star Wars later this year, it's going to be insane what you're going to see. I tend to feel, sort of work in visuals. I'll, I'll come up with an idea of, of a character doing something or a scene where, you know, a figure is traveling from here to here, but in a certain landscape. or and that's sort of a signifier to me. And that's, I think, why in, in my short film, I never named my hero. He's always called Boy. That was the funny thing about him. He was always this, this small hero. He could be anyone. He could be you. He could be the viewer. And that was a lead in. It was never it was just Boy. You know? And whereas you name a character and you do that, and then, and then you figure out what he does, you're invested in that specific idea and so I I think I'd like to do that I'll come up with a character and maybe think okay so this can this can be in this situation or I'm I'll write a story and then find where that's leading and go well here's where something can happen here's where someone can meet someone you know and and then your mind can f sort of have a boundary to, to a box to sit in and then freedom to figure out what that character is and that's what you know Terry Jones did on Labyrinth, and that's what um, my father does with his creations and ideas. Because you know you you sort of set your little parameters of of the world, because and then you figure out that character. What's he going to be? What's it going to do? You know, what, how fantastical or how simple? And so it's a balance between those. I think people think that I'm attached to the puppets, or I'm attached to the things that I make and the characters you sort of come up with, and it's not really the case. You know. You, if I'm building a puppet, I go through the process, I do the creative thing, I know who the character is, and I'm invested in it, and I built it, and it's sitting there, and now it has to come to life, and that's when you have a puppeteer or an actor, you know, you have a puppeteer to manipulate it, and then you have potentially an actor's voice to bring it life, and that's a whole other world. I mean, I think it's the excitement of new blood, you know, new things coming in, an influx of, of creativity. Um, I had a character that I built for the film, and it was his name was Digby, and he was like my favorite thing in the in the whole you know script. And he doesn't say a thing, he doesn't say anything. It's all reaction and and, and look. And so when uh, David Skelly, the puppeteer, came in and put him on for the first time, and started talking with him, you know, in in certain voices, he made the whole crew laugh. And and I went, that's it, that's exactly what I want. And I have no words for him to say. And it was so, it was a moment of, if I could go back and write something, or let, well, can we put something in? And we had a long discussion about it. And then and finally I said, I love absolutely everything about your character and, and the amount of things you're saying, and it's funny, and you have the perfect character that I never thought could exist in that puppet. Okay, now let's put it all inside. And I have to keep it internal. And so, but it comes out in the performance. Mm. So that's, it's a journey. It's, I mean, every puppet you build, every puppet at Leica we build, it's a journey. We have no idea until we do those steps. You know, you see the design, you sculpt it for the first time, you build the puppet, and then you hear the voice that goes with it. And then you've got an animator giving his influx into this. You know, his little nuance, his little movement. We'll have months of the animators trying a character out. The, the hero saying, Paranorman, uh, Norman or Eggs from Box Trolls, they'd spend months just doing walk cycles or different things and, and motions and movements because uh, in that case you find your boy, you find your hero, you find the, the character and the way he moves and then you set your style for the film as well. So it's that's a time that's just it's insane and wonderful to see them put passion into something that's inanimate. A, a good example was... Um, Jim Henson, and he was on, doing TV interviews, and he would have Kermit with him. You would look at Kermit. You would react to the, to the puppet, and Jim disappeared. But he's still there. You know, and I've found that. I've, I take puppets out into, into crowds, and, and I don't hide myself, but I have the puppet, and no one pays attention to me. I'm always, you know, I'm always disappearing, and the puppet is alive. 
and you have kids that come up and 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 just love it and talk to the puppet as as if he's completely real and are afraid or curious or excited by what he has to say and and what he's going to do and that's that's magic that's in front of your eyes you know to to have that you know that connection with a fantasy character or you know or as simple as a sock sort of thing it it really your you suspend all disbelief of everything because it's absolutely real because it's right in front of you i think puppetry is it, it's that little danger of not knowing what could happen because anything could happen and and that's that's a beauty that's something that you you don't lose from any generation even modern kids today they love it and they they freak out and and everyone's on their cell phones and they're all looking at screens so when you show them something real right in front of their face they can't escape and they have to join in and that's why i think like street theater and and puppetry when someone gets out in public and does something like that that's magic as an adult, you find you feel really silly, and I have a, a two and a half year old son now, and so I'm I'm learning this myself. But I, even I feel a little silly doing certain things, you know, like playing around and and moving my own body. But if I'm just moving, like you say, a hand or a part of, or you know, a puppet or anything like that, freedom, absolute freedom. The Muppet movies did so well when mm. they came out, and Dark Crystal came out, and no one knew what to do because it was it was dark. It wasn't. Henson's mm -hmm. and yet it truly was that was his project that was what he wanted to create so over time I mean like it stood the test of time because everyone started watching it like you know and and the cult following that followed and, and the generations mm -hmm. after that but yeah it was a slow build it wasn't you know and you know, movies today if they don't do well on the first weekend then it's a flop and it's always that thing and it's always been that way and that really hit that hit Jim a little hard but he went on and we, you know, they did Labyrinth. But that stood the test of time. You know, that became the cult thing as well. You know, it's, but at that very moment, the movies didn't necessarily do well. And Labyrinth had a hard time purely because at that very moment, E.T. came out. It was Labyrinth and E.T. at the same time. No one's going to beat E.T. I mean, you know, it's like releasing a f movie in front of Star Wars right at the same moment. Yeah you're going to fail. And so that was the problem. But it's, and that was, at least it was another puppet. You know, I think people are starting to realize that, especially with whatever, um, downloadable media and Netflix and all those sorts of things. It's not necessarily the opening weekend now. It's the longevity of a piece that you want to see time and time again. The, the way we view films, the way we see things, because people now will watch it on their phones. You know, so you're, you're actually pandering to a different audience because how many times, especially if you've got a family or a life that you're you, too busy in, do you get to go to the theater? Do you get to go and sit on a big screen in the dark and actually watch a film beginning to end? It's not as often as it used to be, I think. And yet you can watch it when you're on your way to work or you can do it, you know, have a free moment on your iPad, on your iPhone. And that's a different culture that's coming out. And people are recognizing that. The industry's recognizing that. And we're going to and we're going to go with that too. I mean, we have to, you know, as a whoever creatives we are, we, we have to see where that takes us. Puppets are a journey. Every puppet that we build is a journey because we don't know when we see the design, you see one look and then you sort of get the idea of a character or you get a description of what he's meant to do. And then you see the storyboards and you see how much action he has to do. And at that point, you know, anyone's just guessing, they're drawing the character, doing these crazy things. So we start taking from the 2D animation idea. Um, we see how far the storyboard artists and the director are pushing the idea of this character. And that's, that's the beginning for us. And then someone like Kent Melton will sculpt the, the maquette. And it's the first time you get to see it in, um, in three dimensions and it's in a pose. So you sort of start getting clues. It's, it's like, it's piecing together. It's, it's um, the whole thing, the whole visual story. Because we're now guessing it, okay, he's like this. He's gonna move like this. We've got a, we've got a villain who, you know, is a very arched back sort of character, is very proud chested. That has to come through in the puppet itself. Because now we have to then re-sculpt the, the whole thing. Then we, we, usually puppets in a, Da Vinci T-pose type thing 
and we're guessing. We're sort of having long meetings about the idea of, okay, so it needs to have his arms up and he has to run and jump and do all these things, but he has to look proud as he's doing it. So how do you, do, how do you make that happen? And so we spend a long time debating that and sculpting something. And we usually have to then, it's a process. You know, that's why it comes down to a team effort of, we have 60 odd people in puppets who are building these things and working together trying to figure that out. So we go through R&D. We do a lot of movement tests. We do a lot of armature movement tests and range of motion that we can get from a character. Shoulders, hips, breathing rigs. You know, we have, we have chest movers. We have all sorts of oddity, strange things that should seem like they're simple and they're really technical. And that was the, that's where the, the sort of the work and the creative work that we do comes into it because we are always exploring how far we can push because in animation you can push like, to the extremes that you can't with an actual human being. And that's the beauty of animation. And that's so we are always striving to do as that as much as possible. Because you can you can do a human in a walk cycle and, and that and make it look natural and that's fine. But when we do a walk cycle at Lycra or something, it's gotta be dramatic or it's gotta have these things, these motions, these movements you wouldn't necessarily think about. And it has to look like animation. And we build those into the puppets. We're thinking about that the whole time. It's all calculated and it's all it's all, you know, built on top of each other. I'll always be um, told and asked to put in you know, like elbow points and knee points and shoulder points and and you know we carve the hips in to find figure that out what's going to be underneath all of this and then what's going to come on top of it and it's it's a it's a ballet it's a you know it's a it's a true ballet of of these people all in chaos creating what you see on the screen and it's that's one character so let's do it again for a whole cast, you know, of up to 20 different characters. And it's fun, it's really fun. That's where we get to be creative because after that, we have to then redo it again. You can't do it once. You've got to, you've got to make sure these characters work however many times you make them. So, you know, Eggs and, and Norman, there are about 28 of them, you know, to be able to run through a whole movie because all the animators are gonna do it and they all have to do the same thing. So, you know, you, you, you get the processes down, but it's the finding that character. It's always great to be able to make costumes for puppets. You don't have to, you know, invest in bolts of fabric to create something extravagant. You know, you can use a couple yards and 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 create this amazing coat or these dresses or things like that. And then you go into stop motion scale and it's even better. And it you know, you have different challenges because they're this size, you know. But you have such freedom you know, to be able to make that. And I like working, I'm very tactile in my creations and the the feel of the fabric, the weight of the fabric, you know, how it drapes. So you use certain fabrics and I, I'm fascinated by all of that. I'm fascinated how it works at different scale and, and how you can push those things. We um, know the ethos at Leica is do it the hard way and do it the right way for us, which is if it's going to hit, we know it's gonna hit. And we build in so many things, so many panels, so many wires, so many pieces into those costumes. They will only move where we want them to move. We know exactly what that's going to do. And that's, that's kind of an, an amazing ingenuity of, of, of forethought of, you know, of a character. So when we, st when we have that design and that look of film, we stick to it. And we, can't, we don't adjust for that purpose if we can help it. There are certain times when you sort of, with a shoulder or something like that, and it has to loosen a little bit, we find ways around that. But for, uh, we either spend a lot of time making things not move, especially hair, you know, it only wants to move, because an animator's touching it, um, it only wants to move if you want it to move, you know, and same with a costume, because if you put your fingers on it, it can't move unless you want it to move, because otherwise you're into the world of chatter and, and different looks and different things that you don't want and the animators don't want. So we're very careful when it comes to that. The director and the story artists, you know, and the storyboard artists and the animatic guys, they're all doing this first, you know. They, they've storyboarded the, the whole film and they're doing it animation-wise and they're doing it to what the director would like and how, um, 
And so they're not necessarily thinking about the puppets in a good way. You know, this is what I want to see and what's possible. So that's the conversation you start having early on. So all of the all of the heads will get together of the departments and they'll be shown the film. They'll break the film down and we break it down into scenes completely and sequences. So then we take each sequence and then we break that in, into what the puppet has to do from beginning to end of that sequence. And that can be a couple seconds, it could be half a second, it doesn't matter. It's the cuts that are made. And it's always changing, it's always being tightened till that moment that we start filming it. And it's, um, that's the moment that you sort of go gesture-wise, you know. And a lot of things are possible. There, is, there isn't um, many times that you, you say, well, we can't really do that unless it's, you know, he, you know, he runs, he jumps, he flips, he does all this, and then he flies around the room like a little ball. And you go, okay, well, can we just do this, you know, and do like two moves less or something like that for time purposes or the puppet wise. But usually we all sit there and go, okay, <laughs> let's figure that out. <laughs> let's make that happen. I think my offer is to bring puppetry, to bring magic and to bring the idea of fantasy being this close to you. You know, it's, it's, it's right in front of you and you can reach out and touch it. I want the world to see that. And I, I want to give the world that magic and that feeling. When I create my things, when I give a story, when I push as hard as I do for something, that's what I'm trying to tell the world is it's doable, it's believable, it's right there in front of you, the magic is real. <laughs>